slitting the underside of the skin one, lengthwise from the ankle six, down. Seven, eight, the cut the main tendon and one, start to work off eight, the skin four, by cutting five, six, around seven, it with a sharp knife. Ten, all of those doing one, projects we just one, one, two, two, three, three four, five, 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 six, seven, eight, 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 eight,
Yeah. One character. I personally just like the look of the pen, too. You know, it's got battle stuff. It's got character. You know, it kicks quickly, it has incredible heat control, and it's pretty light to maneuver on the stick. It can go in the oven, or you can just stick it into a fire up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you get it that hot, you're going to have to look at it through these special little glasses right here. Leftover from the eclipse. That's hot. Use like your own carbon steel pan or any of their other cookware. You can use the link in my description to save on your order. Thank you, Maiden, sponsoring the video. So I'm going to make this thing called chicken mousse before I do anything because I need that ingredient in order to make the film. So it's over here, and he says it makes about a pound worth of chicken mousse if I follow the recipe. Um, however, I only need a cup and a quarter of it over here, so a pound worth. To translate to a cup and a quarter, I hope. I don't know. I'll find out. Well, I'm going to start this off with steaming in the whisked. Thank you very much. Skinless seven ounce One, chicken breast two, here. I removed the sinew and just kind of roughly chopped it up. That goes into my uh, food processor. I might slip the custard. I don't know. I have a bit of a brain. Process the chicken flesh. Flesh. Sounds uncooked and raw. I don't think you're supposed to cook it. No, there's no way. It's just a brain fart. It's a quick brain fart, that's all. Then goes just a pinch of ground mace. And then I need a tablespoon of tarragon. Chopped tarragon. I don't know how chopped the tarragon actually has to be. You know what? Let's put it in the food process. One minute. So in this mix, I need juices. Something feels funny about this egg. I haven't opened an egg and there's like a surprise on the inside. Alright, all good. It's just a normal egg. Ah, Michael got my head back. In goes that egg. Two teaspoons of salt. And hit it. Halt to oblivion. That looks pretty good. Before I do anything, I set it up for 10 minutes. 10 to 15. There's no room in the fridge. So you have to make sure. The reason I have to show this mix is so that it doesn't separate from the cream. Two. You know? So I have like half a heavy One. cream here. And go. You know what? Keep it running. Two. It's used for stuffings and fillings and stuff like that. Exactly what we're doing. Marco's getting cheeky there and saying, have a taste. Uh, I mean, good. But we're not done yet. I'm going to need a bowl and a sip. Thank you. And we have the fun task of now having to pass. So we have the fun task of passing this through the sieve. I don't know how that's going to go, how long that's going to take. Uh, but you might as well just get started now. <laughs> uh. As much as I do think that's going to go through the sieve, we'll probably get to lose some of that tarragon. No, it goes through too. Okay. And I'm doing this to ensure a velvety texture. Get comfortable, it's going to take a while. This looks exactly the same as what has already passed through the sieve. The only difference is I'm losing minutes of my life doing that. For what? For a velvety texture. This already looks velvety. It looks beautiful. I'm not going to be able to tell. It. No way. No how. Here's a very interesting ingredient. Something that I have I have cooked with before, so I'm not as alarmed as I used to be. This, my friends, is called sweet bread. This is an internal organ of veal, the finest gland, I believe. I only know this because I cooked this before with Julia Sal. So. Um, not with her, her recipe. I wish. It doesn't look like much, but it's a fit for upper. Uh, it used to freak me out, but uh, I'm over that. This is what I have noticed following around to Marco's recipe. So there is a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff that I'm just like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so remove the sinew and the membrane from the sweet bread. That's all he says about that. There's a step that I thought was necessary that isn't mentioned in this book. If you soak the sweet bread in cold water for like three hours, 
And that's going to help rinse off the blood. <laughs> like that, that's so rare. But let me just get the exact reason I did it, Al Cody. I'm going to go get the little handbook. Oh. Where Marco just assumes you know what sweet breads are and that you've cooked with them before, Julia's like, no, I got you. I appreciate that. She says soaking sweet bread for several hours in cold water softens the filament with hydrogen so that it may be removed to dissolve the bloody patches and to whiten them. Right? Bloody filaments. We got it. JC, coming in clutch. So we're going to remove that membrane. Yeah, that comes right off. <laughs> oh, yeah. The whole thing is freaking sinew and filament. It's hard to know exactly what you're removing. You know? Yeah, I've cooked with it once, but I'm by no means any expert in this topic. I've decided that any funky looking bits on the sweet breads I will remove, like the sinewy part here. But if you start removing too much of the membrane, the whole damn thing falls apart. And that's okay in my circumstance because I'm going to be keeping this all up. The membranes and the sinew, Marco wants me to hold on to that. And it's going to go into a stock. And then we got to cut these sweet breads into pieces. Two. I have a whole rack of morale mushrooms. I know a guy. Actually, no, I don't. I had to go looking for them. And it took me a little bit of time. And money. I don't know why I put them on the cutting board because I need a bowl. Thank you. Put these into a bowl and I need to soak them for 10 minutes. How do you like me now, mushroom non washers? 10 minutes to soak and then you drain, rinse, repeat. High heat, pan. Try to drain the sweet breads as much as possible, but they're still pretty wet. This is one pound, six ounces of sweet bread. I'm frying this up until it's golden brown and has a crunchy texture. Most sweet breads are completely Four. soaked. All that water is going to have to evaporate before these things start really cooking along. Just to speed up the whole process here, I'm going to get rid of that water. All right, you just keep them moving, keep them moving. There is quite a uh, smell. It's awful. It's awful, you know? So they got like a crunchy feel to them? Yeah, they do. A half an onion dice. Along with one and a half ounces of soap. Soaked morels. Got to season with some salt. Again, Marco is asking for white pepper. Marco loves the white pepper. And we're only cooking this for one minute. Only. And then that's it. So I need the colander. Thank you. And boom. And I need to keep it. Thank you. I need to get this into the colander to drain to allow this to cool. So let's do other things while we wait. Six. Blazing pig's feet are done. Coming in hot. Whoa. Look at the color on those trotters, eh? I can say every day. Um. So those should be a wonderful oak brown color, she says. They certainly are. They look very fragile, so you're not gonna have to be you're gonna have to be pretty careful with those I'm gonna leave those be until I'm ready for them. I don't need them just yet. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our sauce now. There's quite a few ingredients for this one. And everything is just taking quite a bit of time, so I'm just gonna Sorry. speed check. Let's get it. Evidently, there's a lot going on with this one. So let's just go into the stove and see what it says. Together. It's up. So my favorite sauce pan here on a medium heat. A little bit of olive oil. Okay, turn off the heat if you think you've made a mad mistake. Chicken leg. Chicken leg. What is chicken legs to you? Are chicken legs chicken feet, or is it like the leg of chicken? The recipe said you need two chicken legs. So for some reason, my brain went to chicken feet. One. Because I was like, okay, well, we're using pig's feet. Why not chicken feet, right? Two. It says chicken legs in the recipe, and I'm only picking up on that now. The thing is that I bought Three. these all, too. So I have a whole bunch of chicken feet. Who in the recipe would like just two chicken Four. legs? Like, that's all it says in the recipe. 
Can we find that kind of bizarre? store. So where were we? Bring that pan back up to the medium heat. Oh yeah, the chicken leg. On the go here, I'm just going to quick dry these off. And you can take a sauce pan. Two. In addition to the chicken legs, I'm adding in the sweet bread to trimming with all that sting you stuff. I don't know. Four. So not cooking all the way through, just until it's all golden brown. One. Keeping in mind that I'm only making a sauce here. And I got two. two whole chicken legs that will not end up in the finished set. You know what I mean? This is like Thomas Keller right here. Four ounces of sliced four. mushrooms. Four ounces chopped shallots. Half a clove of garlic that's been sliced in half. Look at that. Exposing half of those cloves in a sprig of thyme. Half a bay leaf, but I'll throw in the other half free of charge. We know why. Aged cherry vinegar. Just curious what it tastes like. I've never tried it before. Oh, hell yeah. I gotta deglaze the pan with a tablespoon and a half. All talk, man. Turn up the heat and freaking deglaze this thing. Cognac up next. I mean, another tablespoon and a half of this. There's a tablespoon and a half. Pretty fancy ingredients today. Uh, and I gotta deglaze the pan again. Now I need a cup. Wi-Fi passwords and more. And this is supposedly another tool that hacks into your camera and computer webcam. Malicious software like this is all over the public internet. And it gets shared and spread around by threat actors, adversaries, and cyber criminals. And they even get it into code, like libraries and modules, stuff used to write other software. Like, look at this. This library, HTTP Current, this was literally a module that was available on PyPy. The official Python package index and library where others could download code to use in their own applications, projects, and software. And this was an information stealer. It would just pull things out of browsers and do everything that we might expect in that strain and family of malware. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but what this does is actually uploads, posts, and pushes all of the data and information that could steal, and it just slaps it up on Telegram. So that the adversary, the threat actor and cyber criminal, has a home base to be able to retrieve and see all that information. And this is pretty common, if you didn't know. Even looking back at that oak grabber info stealer we saw just a moment ago, it would go ahead and post all that information into Discord. It'll grab your IP address, city, country, geolocation the best it can, and passwords for any web browsers that you might use, or even phone numbers, addresses, things that are stored in your web browser. So here's the thing. In this video, we're going to do a couple different things. We're going to do some malware analysis, and we're going to do some threat hunting, looking for those adversary threat actors and cyber criminals, and what they're sharing for different malware samples, or even logs, information that they've already stolen. There's going to be a lot of cool stuff to demo in this video, oh, no, but I want to start looking and hunting for some of those threats that are out there. Now, I love to track this stuff down with Flare. Flare is this awesome tool, an incredible cyber threat exposure management solution. When you use Flare, you can create these identifiers for yourself, for your company, for your business, your organization, or anything that you just want to track and make sure there isn't stolen information already public and put out on the internet and even the dark web. We can see our own exposure score. Hey, what's our risk? What threat model should we be worried about? Hey, what is already out there, like exposed credentials or information, sensitive data that we don't want public? Here, let me show you super duper quick because I've gone ahead and created some identifiers for myself, for my name, for my company, and I like to use this for security research because this is like the most incredible thing. I could be looking for different ransomware events. Say that some threat actor or ransomware group has compromised the company and they've published that information out on the dark web. I could actually go search for specifically if I wanted to dig into those ransomware leaks or Telegram channels where a whole lot of that cyber crime is talked about and shared. We could look at different marketplaces where tools and information might be sold, maybe different forum posts where that's out and about, and of course, even just the open internet like Google or Amazon S3 buckets, a GitHub, stuff that just shouldn't be out there. And you know what? Let me go ahead and simply add a date rant because I don't want to show you any like actual current victims, especially in ransomware incidents or 
elite credentials. But if I bring this back, maybe about a month or so, maybe December of 2023, I can go ahead and look and see, hey, yeah, there are some ransomware leaks, and we can track down what is included in this. Hang on, super quick. It's getting, I'm like starting to sweat in here. Here's another example, and Flitter will even show you the post that's published out on that Onion link. Or the Tor Hidden Services, the big long spooky URL to go access that page, and it might even be able to pull some of the leaked files. Then we can track down some of those stolen logs, like passwords or credentials, especially coming from the info stealer malware, and we're chatting about that a lot. But you know what? What we could do is actually use this for some research, for some threat hunting, threat intelligence, and just see what is out there if we just wanted to search for it. Flare also gives us the capability to kind of do like a big giant Google search across the whole dark web. Let me show you this. I'm going to toggle the feed here to look for hey, something in the global tenant, right? And I can get basically anything that Flare is pulling in for intelligence. It's collection here. Now I could search for whatever I wanted, like oh malware or ransomware or something that we haven't done yet before is Discord. I think that would be kind of a cool term to see what weird stuff that we get. Let me go ahead and search for this and wow. Okay, so that is already pulling potentially some leaks for Discord credentials. Uh, and I'll probably have to redact some of that because it's genuine passwords. But this got a million events. Holy crap. Okay, so let me uh, narrow this and you could maybe change the severity of what we're looking for. But I want to specifically look for Discord Steel. Let's enter that in quotes. So we'll get exactly that wording. Oh, and this is wild. Hey, something on Breach Forums, kind of a bit recent, saying, look, we're selling some stealers. Here's a Discord stealer or a wallet stealer out and available. I think I can go ahead and make this just uh, current. Let's set the date to all and see what weird stuff is happening, like right now. I will even change the categories here, though, because I kind of want to see this stuff happening on Telegram. So let me get back into the illicit networks. I'll toggle everything off, but just get the chat room. Just get the Telegram channels where some threat actors are chatting about information stuff. Oh, here's one on the jacuzzi. Oh, goodness. Okay, we've already uh, done some damage with the jacuzzi Telegram. But you can click on the content tab here, and you'll be able to see all of the communication back and forth between that chat. And uh, bear in mind, look, these are bad people uh, that have ill intentions, right? So that you might see some curse words or profanity or things that just really aren't of the most humane. But look, we can kind of just keep cruising, all right? Like, obviously, uh, a couple bad usernames here, and just the language is quite a bit... Okay, yeah, Jesus. Let's keep cruising and uh, find something different here. Hey, someone asking, look, can I get any Discord stealer source code for free? Let's see if that is available. This user's asking, who has Discord stealer source for free? With a build bot, something working. Someone responds, yeah, you can find them on GitHub. Yeah, we saw that already. And then some other responses here. Yeah, just <laughs> look online. Go ask Google. Just search for yourself. There are just like tons of results here, and it's kind of wild to look through these. But you can see a lot of their tooling, a lot of what folks are selling, a lot of those different chat rooms, and oh, rat developers of some community. Take monitor. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Steelers Logs Group. Hey, please, I need a free Discord server that can grab all the browsers, including the Outlook email clients. There's a malware developer chat. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Hacking Leaks chat? I'm super interested in this. Look, they say, uh, Discord Stealer for Learning. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's Oak Rabbit. Nice. Look at that. We're coming full circle here. Now, here's the thing. Remember, Flair will give you the link. Like we just saw the Tor Hidden Service, the V3 Onion address, but we can actually go grab the room link for that Telegram channel and go poke around and explore, see what else is there. And uh, before we do that, gentle reminder, look, this is all for education's sake, just to kind of see what is out there, just to know what threats are in the world and security research. I uh, don't by any means mean to be uh, enabling or advocating for some of that stupid, crazy, dumb cybercrime stuff. Don't be a cyber criminal. Don't do this. Don't download software. You don't need to do it to stop. We grab that URL though, and let's see what we can do. Hacking leaks chat. Oh, 13 oh, members. This guy's small, it's kind of tiny. Okay, uh, here we are in the hacking leaks chat over on Telegram. Uh, some weird messages to join another Discord server. And oh, HTTP browser method for threading. Interesting. Weird stuff. Scrolling back in time. What the heck is 
What on earth? Six. Oh, this is so silly. They're trying to, like, DDoS some stupid sites here. Seven. <laughs> Spotify taken down, oh, by an HDTG flood? They're going to like, hey, can you take down the site? Can you take it down? Please help me take down this website. Bro, DDoS Telegram, well, I'll tap the link. Mr. Lucifer says, hello, I can buy a botnet. Inbox me. DM me. Okay. There is really strange stuff in here. Couple cat chips though. All right, can't complain about that. <laughs> All right, you know what? Whatever. We'll just keep cruising. We'll move on. Uh, I'm sure there's some other weird stuff. Yeah, he, black hat hackers. Whatever stealer that they've seen. It's the most skinny Discord stealer I've ever seen. Oh, what is the conversation here? It's in Python. It's in Python. I like that meme. Yeah, I'm going to send garbage from GitHub. It still works. Okay, I mean, can't complain about that. All right, so I could just look through Flare and go find some weird, wacky stuff across the internet and the dark web for hours on end. And again, keeping tabs on our own exposed attacks here. But seriously, you should check them out. But I do want to do something more with this video, right? Because a lot of those info stealer malware samples or just any other form of malware might just push data out to Discord or Telegram. And I'm interested in Telegram, and I want to show you why. When we Six. got to see that info stealer malware that was literally a Seven. Python library that can be installed and, hey, some poor innocent user might not even realize that it's running, again, all the stolen information gets pushed out over to Telegram. But the way that they do that is by using a Telegram bot. And I'll have a specific bot token and a chat ID where it just blasts all this stuff out to you. Now, the wild thing is, when we can get our hands on that malware sample, or even if it's in just stupid, simple Python, like, hey, we were making fun of in those chat rooms, look, you could still actually maybe potentially track down the Telegram bot token and the chat ID that they use for this campaign. And that can be kind of wild, because that's basically the keys to the kingdom, is to interact with that bot. So if I keep scrolling through here, I think we'll be able to track down and literally find the values that they're using for their bot. Let me get back down Six. to the bottom here. Look, you can see the, the message format that they would send. This is in front, right? But, uh, did I cancel? it? I might have. Let's look for that chat token. Oh, there it was. Ooh, look at this. Telegram token, chat ID, and notification information. This is some juicy information. Because, eh, we might be able to go see what that bot has been up to, what messages has it sent, and who all is actually communicating with it. And with that, I wanted to show you this super cool tool called Teletrack. And this is relatively new, by the way. I think this was put together last month, and it's by one of my good friends, or I like to consider him a friend, Costas, or Costas. I don't know how to say your name. He is one of the genius individuals behind a lot of the DFIR report information on digital forensics and incident response, and he put together this tool to see how threat actors and adversaries are working with your Telegram bots inside of Telegram in the messages that they might send. So this tool will assist analysts in tracking and disrupting active malware campaigns that use Telegram for command and control. With this code, you can view all the channel messages and download all the uploaded content, such as the documents, photos and videos and other media, and pull that down onto your machine to further analyze. You can retrieve just basic information about the Telegram bot, understand who its owner is, and other channel-related information. And if you really wanted to, you could delete all the messages there if you wanted to disrupt their operations, or you could just totally spam the channel and send it messages over and over and over again. Now, again, let me say, take this with a grain of salt. It is, again, for that research, and you kind of have to have your own moral compass with this sort of thing. But put that in the back of your mind, right? Now, using Teletracker is super duper easy. I can just go ahead and get clone, we'll go grab the repository. Now, I'm inside of a Linux virtual machine. I'll be using Remnux, the Linux distribution for reverse engineering malware, and I can fire up a terminal, and what I'll do is just full screen this super easy, so I could get clone that repository. I hold it down, and I should just be able to run this telegatherer.python script, and install the dependencies as needed. So let me pip install tag r requirements.txt and grab all the dependencies that we need to run this. Time. Super duper easy. So let me try to run our Teletracker. And I guess it's called Telegatherer, right? There are a couple different scripts, but I think they've all been bundled into one at this point. Oh, I will actually need to run this with uh, Python 3, and I'll supply tac h to get the help information. Looks like it needs tac t to supply the Telegram bot token, and tac c to supply the chat ID. 
Now, let me show you. I've actually used this kind of already to test it out and play with it on that HTTP concurrent info stealer malware that we saw from PyPod. I just simply ran the script, pasting in the values that we saw from the source code and the malware sample that we got to dig into. And with that, we could actually pull down information about the bot. We get its name, Royal Steel or Royal Steel Bot. We get to see the channel that it's in, all of its permissions and rights, and maybe we could do anything else we want. This is so cool to me. You can see the chat administrators, the first name Centurion. I guess their username is Centurion TLG. And remember, it gives us this list of options, things that we could do with access to this Telegram bot. We could spam any other information, send messages that we want, delete them all, or take pull down everything that it had actually sent. Get all the messages in that chat. Now, I have to say, I was testing that out previously, and while I was able to pull down this information, my next goal was to pull down all the messages that it sent. But I had to step away, go run some errands or some chores, and I lost access to that telegram folder. I guess they had some notifications, hey, you could probably see some of the interaction, and they just broke the telegram. So with that, I didn't have access and I couldn't do that anymore. But for this video, I found another malware sample that includes some of the Telegram bot information. And let's see if we could pull the stuff down. How much information can we get with Teletracker? So back on my command line, I'm actually going to go back into another sample directory where I have this redtrace.exe. This is a executable file, just Windows PE32, and simple small stuff. We could just simply, hey, run strings on that binary. Because, well, probably pretty clearly be indicated, hey, it has a bunch of Python files embedded in it. So it's likely a Python installer that's tied to ESC or compiled executable written in Python. Again, simple small stuff. But now I might use something like PyInstraction on that trace.exe to pull information out of it. It was able to extract all this, but if you note, know, look, this was probably built in Python 3.11. So I'm not actually running 3.11 on this machine. Uh, this game actually only has Python 3 stage with version 3.8.10. So I had to kind of ask, look, could I install uh, simple Python 3.11, and look, it wasn't staged well and easy enough for me on this machine, so I thought I'd use a Docker container. And I'll be totally honest here, I just sort of asked ChatGPT if it could spit it together for me, and thankfully it was willing to do that and give me the script that I could use to go and extract this out. This was actually pretty cool because I haven't seen Uncompile 6 work well on that more recent version of Python, 3.11, but it is at least able to pull out some of the disassembly, and we can use the disk module for that. Here's a simple script to be able to do that. So what I'm going to do is simply add this Docker file, we'll slap in the syntax that ChatGPT was willing to give me, easy peasy. With that, I will build the instance, set up the container for me to run, and we can go ahead and stage a little volume while we run this interactively. Let me put my present working directory into this container so that I'll be able to have all the files here and still disassemble things as needed. Now, inside of the Docker container, since I have the correct version of Python 3.11 here, I should be able to go ahead and use this disassemble script that we have here with the extracted contents of the redtrace.pyc bytecode. And let me actually try to spit out the bytecode.txt. Fingers crossed, that will pull it all down. Looks like it worked here. And with that, we can actually open up and see at least a little bit up. Oh, hey, let's break out of our Docker instance. Uh, let's open up some line text and open that file here. And now we at least have the Python bytecode disassembly that we can kind of make sense of. There's not like pure uh, reading the source code here, but we can at least see all the strings, the objects, everything that might try to do. And that might include potentially the Telegram token. Let me search for Telegram. We can see a bunch of objects for Telegram sender, presumably doing what we would expect, an API to reach the bot, and it will ultimately end up sending data to Telegram. Let's see if we can track down. Yeah, there it is. Exactly what we were looking for, loaded into the bot token or chat ID variables, these pieces of data here. This is what we need. This is what we could give to Teletracker to see if we could pull down any info from that Telegram bot. Now, I'll be the first to admit here, uh, this is uncharted territory. So I don't know how well this will work, if it even will, but let's try it out. Can I use Python with our Teletracker script with tack key pasting in the token? 
and I'll go ahead and grab the chat value just as well. We'll pass that in for taxi. And fingers crossed, literally uncharted territory. I don't know if it'll work, but I hope so. Oh, it does. It did it. It did it. It did it. Holy crap. Okay, what do we got? What do we got for the info here? Look at this. Username is Aspect of a Bot. Chat information was Notorious Hector. Uh, peculiar. Get some of the information out. No administrators. Apparently. Uh, okay. Chat member count is two. Is there any messages in there? Longer for new messages. What we could do. Maybe send the message to that channel. Spam the channel. Delete all messages. Or get them. Let me see if I can do number six. Can I get all the messages from the Telegram channel? Enter number six to enter here. Fingers crossed. Holy crap, there are like a thousand messages. Let me hit enter. Retrieve all the messages. No, I don't care about the specific number. I just want all of them. Enter your choice. Oh, we need an API key. Actually, if we look out the GitHub repository for our Teletracker tool here, they do mention if you actually want to pull all this down, you will need to set up your own API key uh, and stage it here in the .env environment file. So we should be able to do that. They give us just the link here to do it. So uh, that should be all that we need. Let's go ahead and stage that, and I'll get it set up, and I'm not going to show you my Telegram API. Okay, we're back in business. Uh, I have added my uh, .env file set up for the Telegram API. So let's see if we can run this one more time. We'll go ahead and work with the file, even though, yes, we have already seen it. Can we pull out now the messages by entering the number six to get messages from there? We'll see all of them. I don't care what order. I don't need any specific value. Okay, so I'm getting an error here. Uh, peer ID in valid. Peer ID being used is invalid or not known. Make sure you meet the peer before interacting with it. I don't quite know what that means, to be honest. And you know what? Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's a good thing we don't need to rip and pull all of the uh, messages from it. But we could send a message or spam the malicious Telegram channel with a specific message. We need all messages from the malicious Telegram channel that are sent within 24 hours. Uh, we just kind of, I don't know what we should do. Let me go see. What is it that gets sent? We actually use this Telegram sender. Uh, wait, it encrypts files? Yeah. Holy crap. Encrypt file, encrypt complete. Messages, hello. If you're reading this, then you've likely been hit by the red trace ransom. We apologize for the inconvenience. At the end of the day, we just want to get paid. Okay, great. Appreciate that, Ransomer. Download BitPay, send it to this Bitcoin address. Uh, we should look at a decryptor. Six. Dash. Is ransomware? What do they send to Telegram? Seven. Any key message? Oh, oh it sends the encryption One. key that was used so that it would be able to have its two. Equipment. Okay. So they could then offer their support. So it's just communicating and knowing how, what was used to encrypt it. That's pretty awful. And then it encrypts everything, adds a dot red trace at the Five. end. Yeah, rewrites all the files after they've been encrypted. Six. I don't like that whatsoever. <gasps> oh, it's Seven. also ransom node. Info file created on the desktop. That must be the contents that we saw just a moment ago. Yeah, red trace, start directory. These are all the things. The file extensions that we're trying to encrypt. That's insane. Well, now I'm like weirded out because there are encryption keys that are necessary for folks to actually decrypt if they were to do that or paying a ransom. Well, I don't know. I don't want them to pay ransom or either. This is a, that's a conundrum in my mind. <laughs> like deleting all the messages in the channel sounds like a bad idea. Spamming the channel with messages also doesn't sound like a good call right now. Dang. I feel like it's, I don't know, it's a different scenario, right? Two different situations where ransomware, and if, if that's what's sending information to a Telegram channel, or info stealer malware that's exfiltrating out to a Telegram bot. It's weird, but anyway, look. I feel like we've established a point. We've, we've drawn out this fact that malware does send, submit, upload, and exfiltrate data to a lot of these online things like Discord or for Telegram. And Teletracker is one of these tools that you might be able to use to streamline the stuff that you could do with the Telegram bot token, key, and all that access. If you're up to that research and that analysis, again, at the end of the day, if you are trying to track this for your own sake, for your own information, for your business, for your company, if you want to understand what risk is out there, what is your exposed attack service, and what threats are out there across the internet and the dark web, Flare is one of the ways you can do that. And with that, look, of course, this video is sponsored, and I appreciate all of Flare's support in helping the channel do what it can do. So seriously, thank you for that. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I honestly thought this was kind of cool because, look, it's just digging around, seeing the malware that's out there, and trying to understand what more it does and how you might be able to do something with that as well. So I hope those are some good tools in your toolkit. 
tried teletracker if you came the right way. But look, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Link in the video description. That would be awesome. Take care. years investigating the Zero Day Marketplace, and a lot of what we know about its history comes from her report. To create this story, we reached out to experts like her, who have actual hands-on experience. Finding and contacting them is a bit more difficult than it looks. The only reason we can do this is you, our viewers, and we are thankful for every token of appreciation you can give, be it a like, a subscribe, or a comment. A small gesture can go a long way. So, the early hackers would attempt to contact the companies and notify them about zero days in their software. And the companies, instead of looking at this as, oh, thank you for this free quality assurance, uh, often replied with a letter from their general counsel saying, if you poke around our software again, we'll see to it that you go to prison. So, it's a buck trip. All right. It's a snappy handle, I got a proxy. You take your zero day and mail it to thousands of hackers across the world, the community gets valuable information, the company gets punished, and you get Four. street credit. Sharing and exploring zero days was a major part of the early hacker culture and a source of pride for many. But as the years went by, this state of things began changing into something unrecognizable. There is a wall, and you really, really need to get to the other side. You have money, you have connections. You have resources. All you need is a hint. You go to Bug Trap and look for names. There is Mnemonics, Alex One, Hack Misty, scores upon scores of handles, a lot of very skilled people who do a lot of work for free. But maybe some of them would like a bit of compensation. You choose one, an email, a polite, well measured offer, and a sum. More than they earn in a year more than the software company is willing to pay for the same button. There are very few problems a bottomless budget can't solve. Years pass. You do the same again and again. You establish stronger connections, relationships, networks. Some of the people are reliable, others not so much. You keep the reliable ones close, the dangerous ones even closer. You are not the only one buying and your contacts are not the only ones selling. A market begins to form and grow. Just by sending some emails, you get zero days that can bypass any wall. And even if you have a problem finding sellers, there might be a solution to that. The middlemen emerge, zero day brokers, companies with shady names and even shadier backgrounds willing to help you in your struggle. They can find whoever you need and conduct the transaction. They will even confirm if the merchandise works and vouch for its effectiveness. They're very much a matchmaking service, right? Government, right, could go and, and post even, you know, anonymously on, on Reddit or you know, some underground forum, hey, I want to go buy an exploit, right? But, but then you're dealing with some unknown, um, some unknown party, you have issues around escrow, right? You know, both trust from the buyer side and trust from the seller side. And so these... Expert brokers work as middlemen and matchmakers. They're holding stuff in escrow, and then they're confirming the vulnerability. They're holding funds in escrow. And then confirming the vulnerability actually works in many cases before even brokering, uh, brokering the deal. And then, of course, for all those services, they take a percentage off. So you buy a snippet of information from a broker or an anonymous hacker online. You confirm that the vulnerability works, and you develop an expo, a piece of malware that can reliably turn one blob piece of code into a safe passage through the wall. Time to use it. What you are looking at now is an exploit, not an actual one, but a reconstruction a researcher managed to piece together after scraping the remains of an attack on his phone. It's designed to affect iPhones through an invisible iMessage. The user never gets a notification, not even a blip on the screen. A snippet of code just slips in and stays completely silent. It begins working through a particular bug, a flaw that existed in Apple software for decades, a remnant of a function that has long been discontinued, a deformed brick that once supported a wall but no longer does. After slipping through, the code takes over a small part of the phone's memory, just enough to get some minor things done. Using this memory, 
the message finds a much larger hole in the wall. Another zero day through which an even more malicious code can be brought through. It's unexploitable from outside, but once you're in, you can use it. The new code is more potent, and it begins a war on the phone's native systems. A short battle rages under the fingers of the unsuspecting user until the invading code uses yet another vulnerability, one that allows it to bypass all defenses. In several seconds, the iPhone is conquered. Finally, one more vulnerability is used to gain access and take over the Safari browser. Now, the phone is at the mercy of the intruder and will report everything the owner does, sees, or hears a string of four zero days, an entire attack chain tied together by some very well-written code giving you unrestricted access to any iPhone on the planet. The researchers called this chain Operation Triangulation, a weird name for an attack that has four prongs, not three. But who are we to judge? Weird naming aside, these exploits are incredibly potent and incredibly dangerous. And to get that sort of capability, you have to pay the price. Just like with almost anything on an open market, the price is a reflection of the usefulness. One of the very few glimpses we get into the cost of attacks like Operation Triangulation is a list by Zerodi, a major broker company that actually publishes its prices. According to Zerodium, a zero day that allows you to bypass a phone's passcode or PIN nowadays is up to $100,000. A zero day that allows you to access their chat application, a web browser, or an email could cost up to a half a million. Zero days that give you access to somebody's phone without any interaction on their part can net two to two and a half million dollars. So, millions of dollars to break into a phone. And that's not even counting the salaries of the small army of hackers who wrote the exploit, making the zero day usable. These are not the amounts of money you pay to keep tabs on your cheating fiance. The people who use these attacks aim a lot higher. The biggest demographic of buyers, um, you know, on open markets is, is probably governments. I mean, I, I, you know, they, they have they have money that cyber criminals, you know, can't touch, um, you know, or can't possibly, uh, you know, can't possibly amass even some these larger ransomware gangs. And the value, right, that they get out of the, um, you know, out of the intelligence that they gain with these zero days is not measured in dollars and cents either. Some zero days are harmless. You know, you find a mistake in the code and. It might be in a system which is not widely used, or if it's even used by some niche audience, it's not uh, that interesting, not worth your effort to break into that One. system. But the systems that hackers and nation states spend a lot of time on right now are iPhone software, Android software, software that touches critical infrastructure, software that touches um, like I said, you know, cryptocurrency systems, uh, wallets that get you a lot of cash uh, in cryptocurrency. You may never know the actual cost of Operation Triangulation. There's only a small handful of broker companies that publish their prices, and countless more that don't. The actual cost of a zero day, let alone an exploit, can vary a lot. A good example of that is Operation Zero, a broker that popped up just a few years ago. In September 2023, it offered the highest price for an exploit that has ever been recorded, $20 million for an attack chain. Things like Operation Triangulation could cost at least as much, or even more. All of that to give you access to a phone, a small device that tracks its users. But some targets of such attacks are bigger. Another zero day bought for a similar price might net you an entrance to a desktop computer or an industrial controller or an entire network that maintains infrastructure of a factory, a military base, a city. Stuxnet, one of the most advanced examples of malware, used a string of four zero days to offer an Iranian nuclear facility and disable it. Not Petra, the most damaging cyber attack ever recorded, used one single zero day to paralyze an entire country for several days causing billions of dollars worth of damage to international companies that operate there. The phone of Jamal Khashoggi, a journalist murdered by the Saudi Arabian government in 2018, was monitored and tracked by the government after infecting his devices through zero days. So far, we've been comparing a zero day to a flaw in a wall, a brick that reveals a hidden entrance. 
This comparison is quite harmless, maybe a bit too harmless. A zero day could also be compared to a weapon, or more correctly, a material from which a weapon can be made, a more powerful weapon than almost anything in the world. With the right set of zero days, a government can wage cyber war against both competing governments and its own citizens. For a government with enough funds to find such a collection and enough skilled personnel to correctly exploit it, any security is no longer an obstacle. And most of these zero days have at some point been traded on the zero day market. They were bought, sold, and shared. This happens every day, right there under the nose of law enforcement, regulators, and corporations that can't and won't do anything to fight it. Why? How is trading zero days even legal? And why nobody treats it with at least a fraction of the seriousness people treat with their weapons of mass destruction?